Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Irina, and I'm the event planner for the Redmond Reactor Space. Before we get started, I do have a few things to go over. Please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We seek to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and our presenter. We do encourage engagement in the chat. This session is recorded and will be available in 24 to 48 hours on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. Links will also be shared in the chat, which brings us to our session. The session is approximately one hour with questions throughout, and our speaker today is Sam Ronsky, who is a regional cloud advocate. I'll now turn it over to Sam. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Sam Ronsky. I am a regional cloud advocate here at Microsoft, uh, focusing on the Bay Area and San Francisco. Um, so. Today, we are going to be taking a look at testing, um, just kind of a general overview of testing. It seems like a good place to start before we dive into some more of the, of the complicated things. And, and testing can be a, a really good place to start if you're looking to learn more about code and how to architect and build clean and good working code. Uh, and it can also be a really helpful thing if you are working on a team and trying to iterate on a project really quickly. By creating a testable piece of software, it means that you can actually uh, deliver that thing really quickly because you'll have some assurances that what you're building works or, or accomplishes what you're intending to do. So what we're going to be doing today is kind of walking through this learn module um, and exploring a little bit of an overview of testing and talking about how you can start integrating this into whatever you're writing, especially if you are a student. Uh, I'm kind of hoping this will be sort of an introduction there. Uh, and it's also a really nice way, um, if if that's the sort of where you're coming from, to start testing. Because if if you get an assignment or you have some other criteria that you need to make sure is fulfilled, you can just write a test for it. Um, this is, this becomes a really cool thing if you're if you're doing uh, maybe you get a, an assignment and it has ten requirements for for your software and they're listed out. You can write ten tests and and then you know that what you wrote satisfies those requirements and is going to pass them. Um, so it gives you a little bit of assurance that the thing that you're handing in, the thing that you're developing is going to work. Um, and that translates directly into a professional career. It means that what you're actually checking in and releasing out to the public also has those assurances and is also going to work. Um, so testing can get complicated and it isn't always easy, especially if you are jumping into a existing or legacy project. Uh, it can also be sort of a catalyst for modernizing those applications. So if you're looking at a old or or uh, application that needs to be modernized, some some legacy application that you want to re-architect or rebuild in some way and deliver in a in a different fashion, uh, it starting with tests and cre creating a series of tests that kind of cover the requirements of what your current system does, and then creating a second system that kind of satisfies those same requirements can be a way to start that modernization uh, pathway. It gives you that uh, starting point. Because um, otherwise, what ends up happening is you just go off and write this other thing. Uh, and, and it can be a little bit confusing, one, because you don't really know if it's still doing the same thing. And two, uh, you kind of have to just turn one thing off and turn the other thing on. And that gets really, really difficult. Anyway, um, talked a lot. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at this learn module. Uh, there's a link in the chat if you're looking to kind of follow along. But we're also going to kind of bounce around a little bit, uh, throw some examples in here and kind of implement some really quick pieces of code just to kind of help highlight what we're talking about here. Uh, so this entire thing is a base uh, is looking at how to introduce testing. Um, so a lot of the uh, theory and, and reasons why we test. Uh, so let's just jump in and start taking a look at this. Um, should should point out, uh, I have worked professionally writing writing tests and, and doing things to kind of architect tests for, for larger pro problems. Um, so what I say might go might be a little bit different than what's here, um, and I'm not going to cover everything that is in this document. So if you want to uh, read through this, definitely follow those links. That will help you. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ways to get testing. Uh, we're going to be looking at two. Uh, we're going to begin at Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio. Uh, I have both of them open, so we can just kind of create it twice and run both of them, and, and we'll get the same results. But it gives us that those options. Um, testing doesn't have to just work with this, though. You don't just have to write it for C Sharp. Uh, it also works in different things. 
uh, and will take a whole bunch of different forms. Uh, there's also a number of different styles of tests that you can write. Uh, so uh, suppose you're building a website that allows users to shop your products online, and you need to start selling internationally. Um, you've extended the phone numbers and your customer information logic to accept international numbers, and you've checked your code with several, several international numbers, and you think it's ready to push the changes and update your app. <laughs> um, but then you push it out, and it, it doesn't work. Um, so you start getting calls, and uh, your database has stopped working. It looks like there's a, there's a bug somewhere in there. Um, how, do you, how do you fix that? Um, so the idea behind a test is to give you some surface area, some, uh, some intuition, I guess, that what you're creating, what you're shipping, satisfies certain requirements, that the contracts that you're specifying and the behaviors that you're telling your code to do uh, match the expected requirements that you're, you're, you're providing. Um, I typically see this written as a given, when, and then a then clause. So you're given some state. Uh, in that example, we were given a database with internet or with num phone numbers in it. Uh, when you attempt to migrate that to a international database to support international numbers, then uh, it should still work. <laughs> uh, it, it can change a little bit. It can become more complicated uh, because uh, it turns out international things, especially and localization, becomes very, very complicated, especially um, more, most recently, uh, daylight savings time is not the same everywhere. Uh, that can be a very big pain when you're trying to write tests for something, because what works in one time zone may or one country may not be the same for everywhere. Uh, and can even change by like state if you're in the United States. It's it's weird. Um, so things can things can happen that can break your code and make things not work. And manually rock, walking through and testing all of these things becomes really difficult and really time consuming. It takes a lot of time. It also means uh, you have reliability and it's, it's a sustainable thing. Uh, if you write a test, it's not just going to be run once and then go away. It's going to run and then every time code is changed in that uh, call path, you're also going to be able to rerun your test. What that means is that if somebody new comes onto your team and writes something that would break uh, critical functionality, uh, or maybe you come back to your code a year later and don't really remember how things are supposed to work and just do some refactoring quickly, uh, it prevents you from breaking things <laughs> and hopefully make sure that what you're actually shipping out is doing what it's intended to. Another useful thing this does is allow you to connect uh, what your code implementation is with what the product requirements are. Uh, you can write tests that describe product functionality in a way that uh, product owners and business managers understand, um, that even they might be uh, partially writing. Uh, you can turn those into programmatic, programmatic tests and use that to actually confirm that the feature that you just delivered actually does what, what they said. Um, so, uh, so. Uh, by the main, by the end of this module, we'll be able to evaluate how testing can improve our code quality. Cool. So, uh, what is testing? We've kind of already covered this, um, but testing is generally a loop. Uh, uh, if you might be familiar with a REPL, uh, which is a read, execute, print loop, um, it's just a, a, a term that you might hear a lot. Uh, that's used typically with uh, say Python or something where you're just coding line by line and getting something to immediately execute as soon as you enter that line. Uh, tests can kind of do that same thing where you, you're intending to kind of have your tests run fairly frequently. Um, and a big point you'll see here is the time that these tests are taking. Most of the tests in this sample are taking less than a millisecond. They're running very, very quickly. Uh, this is some. This is sort of an advantage that you get from unit tests, which are sort of the smallest unit of testing. Um, they're intended to be very, very uh, tightly scoped, and not just span entire products. And that also means that they're typically very fast. The advantage of that is that means that you get really quick feedback loops. Uh, and when you're getting fast feedback loops, it means that when you submit a pull request to your repo, say this is done, uh, you don't get something back that comes comes back to you. Uh, five minutes later and says, by the way, this didn't work. Uh, you want that as quickly as possible, uh, especially if you have dealt with a product where you may have 30 minutes to an hour long build times. Most of that time ends up being tests a lot of the time. And when that's happening, uh, you typically aren't going to have people just sitting at their desk 
Uh, and it can also interrupt your, your actual development flow because you now have 30 minutes to an hour where you aren't doing anything. <laughs> that becomes really unproductive. It means that you're not actually getting anything done and, and maybe you're going to go and grab a coffee or tea or something um, while this is running. Uh, that's typically not ideal. And it also means if you're working in a project that is iterating really quickly, you might even get changes submitted, have other people submit changes on top of what you're, you're intending to submit, and then have your tests fail. And now, now what happens? Um, because now you need to re-merge everything that was added in between the time you submitted your, your change and when it was actually a failed test. Now you have to go and do all of that. Um, optimizing tests is hard, uh, and we're not going to get into that because that, that we're going to focus a lot more on the smaller unit-sized tests because that's where you should start. Um, if you're looking to start for tests, start at unit tests. The only time I might suggest doing something different than that, uh, if you're looking to kind of introduce testing into uh, your product and development workflow, and it's not something that you typically do while developing things, adopting uh, larger like end-to-end -end or integration tests can show more value in initially, and that can kind of uh, lead adoption. Uh, so that's one thing to consider, but it, I would highly recommend starting with unit tests because they will be a lot simpler, um, and they will also kind of pay off more uh, the more you write them. So, so uh, test method definitions. There are a number of different testing frameworks. We're going to be using C Sharp here uh, with Visual Studio, but again, this doesn't have to work just in C Sharp. This also supports other languages. So you can use uh, Spock in uh, Java, or you can use uh, JUnit, which is another Java thing. Um, I don't know what the Python one is. Uh, there's a few of her JavaScript and TypeScript. Uh, pretty much every language you have is going to have testing in it. Even languages like Go ship with testing support directly inside of them. So you get a test package in Go just because that, that's what it does. Um, so depending on the language you're using, the framework is going to be slightly different. Uh, and then you'll get a similar style to this. So what's happening here is we have a test method, which is declaring this is a test. Um, the next thing is a name for that test. Uh, so that's going to be what you'll see back. You typically want this to be something that is understandable. And then the next thing is a range, act, and assert. Um, this can also be a given when then, um, whichever one makes sense to you. A given when then is a Spock thing. Those are actually keywords in Spock. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, so what this is doing is arranging everything, getting everything set up for you. So it's all organized. So this is the state of the environment. Then what we're going to do is act on it. We're going to perform one action. Um, because we're targeting small scoped things, one action is going to be typically as small of a unit as you can think of. Uh, typically not things that are, it doesn't have to be exhaustive. You don't have to test literally everything. And typically you aren't going to test things like private functions. Uh, but what this is going to do is run the calculator's add function and get the result back. It's not going to perform some complex arithmetic. It's not going to run some big complex math thing. It's just going to run one function and say, does one plus one equal two? <laughs> and in this case, we're saying uh, we're asserting that two, which is our expected value, is equal to the result of that action that we took. Um, so this is a little bit of an example. Let's just do that. <laughs> so let's just. Uh, Hold this in, so we're going to write a calculator, I guess. Uh, that's not the right thing. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, so let's throw together a really quick calculator thing. I'm not going to separate these into two separate projects. That's typically what you would see in .NET. Uh, you would have a class library or your ASP.NET website or your console app or whatever. And then you'd also have a test project. Here we can kind of throw everything together. Uh, it'll just make it a little bit cleaner for everybody uh, hopefully, meaning we can keep all of our code in the same thing. Um, I think I can do that and do a file scope namespace. That's a C sharp six feature, which lets you uh, remove the curly brackets from your namespace and just scope everything in the file to the same namespace. Um, let's 
move. I think this can go up here. And there we go. Cool. All right. So we have test one and a fact. Uh, this is slightly different than what you saw in that example because I am using X unit. Uh, there are three main uh, testing frameworks that you'll see in .NET. There's MS test, X unit, and N unit. Um, I'm using X unit, but you can pick any of them. They come with templates uh, that you can just grab. Or if you're using a uh, .NET console, so you can do .NET new, and I think it's just here. <laughs> um, that's not right. Uh, I don't remember the thing list. These are all the templates that you would get. I haven't installed any other uh, new ones, so these will just be what you'd find. Uh, there should be some test ones in here somewhere, and I should have filtered this. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you'll see n unit, um, x unit is down here, and then ms test is somewhere in here as well. Uh, but you can pick whichever one you like. I would recommend playing with all three and sort of figuring out which one you like. Most of the most of the features are going to be very similar, uh, but they will have slightly different syntax that might work better or worse for whatever case you're using. Um, but typically, the the feature sets of testing frameworks are similar across the board. Um, because a lot of the concepts are the same, you're going to end up with mocks and fakes and spies and things like that, um, which we probably won't get to in this hour. <laughs> but the intent there is that you would be able to create different things uh, and then use that to test. Um, so we're creating a calculator. <laughs> let's get slightly less distracted and create a calculator. So let's do class. And I'm going to create an adder class. Um, so what this is going to do is implement the add function. So public uh, int add. And it's going to add two integers. So int a and int b. And we're just going to return a plus b. Cool. Uh, so this is a class that adds two things. So we're just going to uh, create a fact here. So given uh, our adder, so we're just going to do var adder equals new adder. There we go. Uh, when we do some multiplication, so we're just going to do uh, result equals adder dot uh, dot that <laughs> adder dot add one one, and then uh, we expect some results. We're going to assert uh, dot equal uh, two and our result. Uh, so this the two things that uh, Kind of matter here is this equal has two uh, parameters. You it, your test will work if you put it in either side. Um, so if you put the result on either side of this, it's going to work because <laughs> all this is doing is comparing these two and saying is two equal to the result that we got. Um, what's going to end up happening though is you will get a plain English text output that's going to say uh, two was not equal to or the result was not equal to to two. Uh, so if you do this reversed, you're not going to get that as clearly. Um, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. Uh, in this case, X units syntax is that the expected result is on the left hand side. Uh, so we've written a test. <laughs> let's run it uh, and let's see what happens. So if we run our tests, we can do this. This is going to open Visual Studio's uh, Test Explorer, which is going to give us some uh, fun tests. Uh, I am using the uh, free version of Visual Studio. Um, so this is a Visual Studio community. Um, is that the correct thing? I, I, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, but if you have uh, Visual Studio Enterprise, there's additional features that you'll get for testing uh, that we could explore later if that was something that people wanted to know. Um, I'm try trying to kind of cover the basics here, uh, and then we can dive into a bunch of the other fun things, because. Uh, testing is one of those things that can get really complicated <laughs> when you get into it, uh, and, and especially with microservices, it gets complex just because you start having to spin up infrastructure and cloud resources, and then also these things that can talk to one another. Uh, yes, so Community has Test Explorer. It should be available in all versions of Visual Studio. Um, so you can just grab that, uh, and you can see I just ran this and it uh, got that. Um, you will miss a few things, but it should all be there. So you can uh, run all the tests in your view, do all that normal stuff. Um, the only thing you won't get is like uh, real-time rerunning of tests. 
Um, so one of the things Visual Studio Enterprise can do is detect um, certain changes or also detect um, the call stack during a test um, and other interesting things. Um, but those are those are slightly more advanced uh, and they're more debugging tools almost, I think, than, than this. So that's an option. The other thing you could do, um, I don't actually know where I created this project. <laughs> um, OK. Let me go. Let me go find this, <laughs> um, and it's in C sharp. Reactor something. Reactor testing. Cool. Uh, cool. Uh, so we're in the same same thing now in our console. Um, tests are green. Code is clean. <laughs> yes. Uh, so ba basically, that that's sort of what we're aiming for. Is we're trying to get things green. Uh, the downside is I haven't actually seen that my test has failed yet. Um, that is something that you probably are going to want to prove. Um, so one thing that you're going to typically want to do is say, cool, my test is green. Uh, but tests that are always green aren't actually very useful. What that really is is sort of a more complicated form of technical debt. Uh, because now every test that you write is code that you need to maintain. Uh, so what this means is that if I want to change what the adder function does and I want to make it a multiply, um, so... Uh, I suppose, yeah, we can just rename it to multiply. So we can no longer add, we can only multiply things. Um, if we do this, this doesn't work. Uh, even though I changed all of our code, our code is correct. Um, our test now fails um, in, in a few different ways. One, it doesn't compile because we changed the name of the thing. Um, so we learned that. We learned that we're kind of removing things, but that's a syntax error. Um, we also learn is that now, our test also should fail because uh, we're multiplying one and one and expecting two. Um, and that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, again, a, just sort of a form of technical debt because every single test that you write is one that you're going to need to update any time the code path changes. This is one of the times when unit tests become really useful because they're less volatile than a end-to-end -end test. If you have something that spans the entirety of your system that you're building, whatever product it is, if it's doing an entire customer journey in a test, what you're going to run into is anytime any part of that customer journey changes, you need to rewrite that test. Um, and that isn't always super simple. Whereas in this case, we just have to update one line. We just have to change this to one. Uh, so that can get really complicated if you're doing a lot of end-to-end -end tests. Um, it can be useful to get started with uh, legacy applications because they, they show more value. But uh, yeah, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, try to stick as much as you can to unit tests. It will, they'll be faster. They'll run more quickly. You will get more um, useful results uh, because what a unit test does is show you that this is not working in this exact area. Our test is only covering one function, which means if this test doesn't work, we know exactly which function is broken. If we're testing the entire thing, we have no idea. Um, we might get a little bit of hints, uh, but you just seen a test report is not going to actually help you figure out what the error is typically. You're going to have to do a little bit more digging. Whereas in this case, because we have targeted this to just one thing, hopefully it makes your job a little bit easier. Um, so that's sort of what we're trying to get to is make things a, a little bit faster to iterate on. Um, you can also see down in the bottom left-hand corner here, when you select a test that has failed, uh, you're going to get a number of different things. One, you can see what line it failed on. So we can just go directly to the test. We also see how long it took. This one took 10 milliseconds. Um, depending on your environment and what you're doing, that's probably going to change, um, especially if, in this case, we're, we're rebuilding it. But um, you can also see the assert, assert equal failed. We expected two, and we actually got one. Uh, that looks like it might be a little small on the screen, so apologies there. Um, but that's what you're going to get. You're also going to get, like, stack traces if you're throwing exceptions or things like that. Um, so yeah, there we go. Cool. Uh, so this is, I guess, our, our test. Another cool thing, because I think we can just do .NET uh, test on this, and rerun our same project. Um, so this is the same environment. We're just running it from our CLI. Uh, you get the same error. It all prints out the same. One of the cool things you can do here is uh, like .NET watch and test. 
this works really nicely for smaller projects. Um, something that I, I tend to find myself doing, um, especially if you're working with microservices, what this is doing is watching this project for any code changes. So anytime I change this thing, it's going to rerun this test. So I'm just going to go back here. <laughs> We're going to go back to our ad because I want to demonstrate a little bit uh, other things. So let's do this. We're just going to save the file there and our test reran. <laughs> um, so I didn't need to do anything. Our console just reran this and now we have a passing test. Uh, and we can go and rerun this in Visual Studio as well. And this will also pass, <laughs> I hope. If, if they get out of sync, that'd be weird. Uh, so there we go. Um, yeah, hot reloading is super cool. Um, .NET Watch works even before um, .NET 6's hot reloading feature. So Watch has been in uh, .NET for a while now. Um, and then hot reloading was recently added. Um, and it's a feature that I need to play a little bit more with. Um, but they're, they're both super cool. Uh, you can use .NET uh, Watch and plug it into pretty much anything. You can also plug it into, say, Run if you have a web service. Um, so if you're testing your uh, ASP site, you can do .NET Watch Run. And what that's going to do is rerun your, your website um, anytime you change it. So you, your endpoint should always be up to date. Uh, anyway, fun stuff. <laughs> so we have a test. It tests one thing. Uh, let's go back here um, and kind of make our way through this. This is talking through all the stuff we just did. Uh, we can run tests. Another cool thing, uh, Visual Studio will tack on a thing to the function. Um, this, I believe, is a... Um, Okay, so there's a few different things here. Um, testing features do change depending on which version of Visual Studio you have. Um, so you might see slightly different things if you're using uh, Visual Studio Professional or Visual Studio Enterprise. Those are different. Um, so for example, in Enterprise, I believe you will see the tests listed here. Um, so every function that you have in your code will be listed with the number of tests that are passing or not passing based off of that. In this case, we just have a reference. Uh, so this is actually showing the results of our test in line with what we have. Um, so you can actually kind of see some up-to-date stuff for that. Cool. <laughs> um, let's go back here, because uh, this is taking longer than I thought. <laughs> but that's OK. Um, hopefully, hopefully, this is helpful. Uh, so why we test, we've kind of already uh, talked about that. Uh, there's a bunch of different graphs about testing. It's been a software concept that's kind of came in or a lot of the time around like the uh, initial parts of DevOps, it was it was sort of part of that whole thing. Um, testing had been around for a long time, but it's changed uh, in the industry o over time. Uh, and so the idea is you're going to add something new. You're going to test it. You're going to figure out what doesn't work. You're going to fix those bugs uh, and then loop. There's probably an arrow somewhere in between here, fixing those bugs to back to testing and doing that quick loop. Uh, and that's sort of your development cycle. Um, what this does is prevents you from having to run through entire journeys and do um, complex uh, paths and stuff through your application to do something. You can automate most things. Um, and this isn't just code things. You can also automate tests over UIs, for example, or websites. If you want to uh, explore how to click specific buttons in a search engine, you can do that and see what the results are. Uh, so there's lots of really fun ways to kind of get started with testing. I uh, recommend exploring it because we can't dive into that. If anybody watching does have something that they're like, I want to see an example of how to test this scenario, uh, let me know. And then I can, I can pick those. Um, but there's just, there's a lot. Uh, so let's see here. Industry examples. Uh, this is an, another really cool thing with uh, just in general, the open source nature of, of modern development. There's actually a lot of really good ways to go and find uh, testing examples and patterns that people have used for projects very similar to yours. Uh, that can be a really good place to start. Uh, and this one, uh, effects on architecture, is something that I think is probably the most or one of the more important things. Uh, writing testable code is not always easy, but it does, in, in my experience, make your code better in the long run. It means that it's usually easier for people to come in and update later. It also typically means that it's usually fairly well documented because tests also form a form of documentation. We 
uh, that's a different code. Um, but we don't even need to look at that add function. We don't need to look at its implementation to figure out what it's doing. We can look at this test and see that when we add one and one, we get two. Uh, this is a simple example. Um, but if you're, if you're writing more complicated code that's describing a business function, and there's a, you want your thing to behave in a specific way, you want it to take some uh, custom object ID and parse it out in a specific way. You can define that in your test, and that can be the that can be the uh, demo that you give to people and say this, it needs to satisfy this contract and write that in your test. And then the code that actually implements it can go first. Um, some people will start as uh, test driven development, where you actually start with tests and then start doing things. I have never um, found that helpful. Uh, I, I find that confusing. Uh, but it might be useful for you. Everybody kind of does uh, coding slightly different. So that could be something to try if you're looking for it. One thing you can do that might be useful is instead of writing all of your tests and then writing your code, uh, write a test um, and just have something that sort of outlines a general yes, no. Is this in, on the right track? Should I should I be stop um, and actually take a look at what I've done? Maybe do some refactoring uh, that can help. Uh, my typical workflow is implement code, add tests, refactor the code because I wrote it really quickly, um, and then make sure the tests still pass. Uh, and that way you can kind of write really uh, scrappy code that gets the job done, but maybe isn't something that you want to just live forever. <laughs> maybe there's too many to do's or uh, just a really long series of for loops. Whatever you, your result is, uh, you can kind of change it. Uh, so. Uh, another cool thing, uh, code coverage and code health. You might see this referred to in a few different ways. Um, code coverage is the idea of the amount of test coverage you have. Uh, I just use coverage again, so we're, we're going to try that again. <laughs> um, but, but what it, code coverage is, is the uh, amount of your code, your application's code, that has tests that validate that functionality. So in our case, we have 100% test coverage. Because um, we have one function and it has a test. Click the hamster in your head. I'm glad that this is helping. Um, I found tests super intimidating when I was first starting. Um, and then, then I got put on two projects back to back that were implementing testing things. Um, and so, so I just had to really dive into it. Um, my background is a lot of um, modernization of really old, like legacy applications that were. 10 to 20 years old, uh, and then putting them onto the cloud with uh, microservices. And so one of the big components of that was taking these tests and trying to figure out, like, how do we describe these things? How, how do we capture what this is supposed to do? Um, so I'm glad it's helping. <laughs> yeah, we have 100% test coverage here. We have one, one function, and it has a test. Uh, th that is not going to be normal. <laughs> you are not typically going to have tests covering every part of your code. Um, yeah, so monolith to microservice stuff. Um, I did a lot with uh, like super legacy .NET applications like .NET beta um, and bringing them up to uh, new things and, and modernizing those, uh, and then also updating things with Java and, and doing that. Um, so kind of tinkered with a few different things, but also then lots with, with testing and developer experience and, and workflows like that. So yeah, if you have questions about that, feel free to ask. This, this is actually answering my, my point. So this is perfect. Um, so normally aiming for about 80 to 90% coverage is sort of where you want to hit. Um, this is going to change depending on your application. Again, uh, tests are technical debt. Uh, just like your code, it, it's going to result in more technical debt. That isn't a bad thing implicitly. That doesn't just mean that this is not good. What this does mean is that you should, should kind of have intent behind writing tests. Uh, if you're just trying to achieve 100% test coverage, you're probably just going to slow everybody down. <laughs> um, and, and the code that you're, you're writing is, is maybe not as useful. Uh, I ideally try to identify things that are sort of the critical points, the, the parts that are, are going to be something that you need to know is, is working or not. And some of the other things will kind of follow along with that just because of how code works. A lot of code interoperates with one another and sort of embeds with one another. So. Uh, yeah, something to keep in mind, test coverage, uh, 
the people will say different things about it. Uh, really they, figure out what works for, for your goal uh, and try to uh, maybe establish some sort of metric for uh, either test coverage or some other thing that measures code health. There's lots of different things to track that uh, depending on the language you're using. These can kind of help you with code reviews when you're when you're like, I, I don't know if this works. Um, another thing uh, that can be helpful is making sure PRs and code changes have test coverage. So there is tests associated with a change that is being made. Typically, they should be ch checked in simultaneously, which means that you don't just have code that is untested uh, that is now being added into prod. And if they're added two separate times, um, then they're not connected. Uh, typically, merge them together that way. One is linked with the other, and you, you can't really pull them apart. Um, I've done some monolith work, uh, some microservice work, uh, developed some strategies for going from A to B, and been involved on some efforts towards that migration. Uh, biggest challenge is definition for what you want your microservice to cover sometimes. Yeah, uh, tests can help there too, actually. Because uh, tests can kind of establish that contract that you're working towards. Uh, so sometimes if you're just saying, we need to rewrite this app, this maybe this entire mobile app, um, that, that's really hard. Uh, because the, typically, especially with legacy applications, there is history there. There's reasons that the code is the way that it is. Um, typ typically, uh, it's kind of evolved as businesses have shifted, as, as new decisions have been made. But a lot of the times there are requirements that are kind of hidden in why the things operate the way they do. Writing tests can kind of select those things and also make them very clear uh, because now you're saying explicitly, this is what this does. <laughs> um, and then if it's not something that you need, maybe you can check it with your product manager or other leaders and say, this is what we have right now. Is this what we want or should we change this? And maybe, maybe yes, maybe you can just get rid of it. And then you don't need to worry about that when you're modernizing it. But sometimes it, it, it does actually matter. Um, so they can be useful to kind of double check that. Uh, there's also a bunch of really cool um, like testing strategies you can use when modernizing applications. Uh, even, a, even like just writing the current output to a text file and then reading that output in and expecting your new application to do the same thing. Uh, things like that can actually just work. Um, they can be really quick, and maybe they're not something you want in your code base forever. Uh, but if you're just going to make that change for a quarter or for a couple months, it can be useful. So cool. <laughs> um, code health is fun, <laughs> and I could talk about this for a long time. Uh, so check our answers. Uh, which of these options is not a benefit of testing? Oh, no. <laughs> Tests encourage a more modular architecture. Yes. Uh, Tests provide the ultimate indication of repo health. Uh, sometimes, uh, and tests help track uh, the different capabilities of a program. All of these are kind of true. <laughs> um, the correct code coverage goal of a repo is about 70%. There is no true answer. Uh, depends on the repository. Let's see how I do. Tests do not encourage a more modular architecture. Yeah, they kind they kind of do. Um, so one of the, one of the things you'll see with testing is uh, we can actually talk about this a little bit going into Visual Studio Code again. Uh, so let's add multiplication to this. So we are going to take our adder and let's just implement a public uh, class calculator. And this is going to just extend our adder. Uh, and so this is also going to do a public int. And we're going to do multiply a and b. Uh, and then let's do an implementation of multiply that <laughs> is kind of silly, but it'll be fun. Um, so we're just going to do result equals 0. Uh, and then four int equals zero. Well, i is less than b. <laughs> um, iterate over that. And then we are going to take result plus equals a. So this is just multiplication, but uh, complicated. Uh, and we can actually do this a little bit different. Let's do result equals add. Uh, and we're going to add our result and a. Um, so We've implemented multiplication, but we've done it in an incremental way. So it's actually going to add b times in our function. Uh, so now multiply has a direct dependency on add. Um, this can be uh, a little bit complicated because we've 
we're using inheritance in this case. Um, one of the things that I, I like to talk about is inheritance and composition. Um, so right now we have a, an example of inheritance. So we are inheriting the characteristics of adder. Uh, so we want to be able to implement this. Uh, this gets really, this can get complicated because if we want to maybe pull out our adder implementation and maybe pull this in to something else. So maybe we want to write a test that validates that we are calling the add function uh, b times in our test. So we, we want to make sure that we call this function as many times as we say we should call it. Not that the result is correct, but that we're actually calling this, the function a certain number of times. Uh, in this architecture, uh, it can be a little bit complicated to do that because there's no clear way to get that add function out of this function without refactoring things. One of the things you can do uh, is in our composition, which is the idea of taking a, an object. So in this case, we have a calculator and separating out the functionality of that object into separate smaller pieces that can be modular. Uh, so in this case, we have adder. What we're going to do is just do uh, I adder um, and I mult, sure, multiplier. Why not? Um, so instead of adder and multiplier, we're just going to going to move this up. Uh, is this the right way to do this? Maybe not. Um, so we'll we'll make it up. Uh, so we can do I adder. Uh, this might be more code than I want to write for this quick example, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, so we're just going to do that. Uh, and so I adder has a int add. Uh, not that. There we go. And add an A and B. And then the other thing we want is what did I just do? There. <laughs> cool. Uh, is I multiplier. And this does multiplication, same thing. Uh, so <laughs> yes, uh, complexity is a fun thing to add. So software developers are attracted to complexity. Um, it, it can be really tempting to write this really uh, cool thing. Um, there's a cool, fun little trick you can do if you want to switch values. So if you have, uh, let's, see, let's, see, let's just switch A and B. So you can actually. I don't know if I remember this off the top of my head, but it's something like uh, equals a uh, Zor B or something. You can actually swap values without using anything. Um, I found that actually making code that's readable and, and people actually like uh, understand uh, it make, makes things so much nicer um, because it, you can there's so many cool tricks you can use or language features that you can kind of uh, combine together and do weird things with. Uh, if you're doing that, try to either add comments or do something that makes it clear what you're doing, uh, because you might not remember the next month you come back. Um, one of the, especially with larger software systems, one of the things that you can do is kind of implement something and then move on to something completely separate. Uh, even with microservices, this can even be like walking away from a specific microservice for months or a year or longer. And then you'll, you'll come back because it's not working anymore and you need to update it, uh, or maybe a, a requirement changed or something. And now you haven't touched that code in a year. Um, and then you have to figure out what to do. Uh, the, the tricks and complexity that you might in, inter, or inject into that can be hard. Um, so anyway, uh, in this case, we have, uh, we're, we're sort of implementing uh, well, I forgot the word for it. Um, inheritance and uh, composition. Uh, so this is an example of composition. And so what we're doing is creating uh, pieces. We're creating an adder and a multiplier uh, that do different things. Uh, so in this case, we want multiplier, which is a multiplier. There we go. Uh, what's this doing? Not all code paths return a value. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, so in this case, we have multiply, which is doing something else. Uh, we're actually just going to the best way to do that. Um, sure. <laughs> Let's throw an adder on there, because uh, 
I didn't really uh, plan out this this in entire thing. <laughs> um, uh, Link is definitely fun. Uh, it can also be really like I, I think with Link, I've typically run into the issue where you run write things that go off the screen because they're so long. Um, and they can also uh, they can get hard to optimize. Uh, and there's a few gotchas in Link because it is lazily evaluated um, that I have fallen for in the past uh, that can trip up teams. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, if people want to talk more about Link, I can do an entire thing, uh, an entire stream just talking about fun Link things you can do. Um, that would actually be super cool. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Link and you're maybe new to C Sharp or just learning the language, uh, Link is a, one of the features of C Sharp that makes it really cool to sort of write uh, almost database queries against data sources in your code. Um, and it allows you to do it in a very fluent way. Uh, so instead of writing for loops like this, you might do something slightly different than that. Um, highly recommend uh, catching up on it and learning a little bit about it. There are other options in other languages like Java Streams. Uh, that you can also look into. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have our adder here. Let's do adder.add. Uh, and now we have multiplier that no longer matches our thing <laughs> because I didn't really think this through. That's okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, so we have our two interfaces. We have our two implementations of those interfaces. Now let's actually do this whole thing. Uh, and instead of, I guess we have a, we have a few different ways we could do this. Um, in this case, I have it extending i adder and i multiplier. That's an option here, and what that's doing is allowing us to kind of abstract away the actual implementation of these two things. So we no longer have um, adder explicitly declared in our function or in our class. Instead, we have sort of the key components kind of pulled off and doing different things, uh, or we can do uh, and kind of store references so we can create a public i adder. Maybe give it a getter and a setter because uh, why not? Um, let's let's not do that. Let's just do a new adder. Okay. Uh, and then a public i multiplier, which will do similar things. There we go. Um, and so this creates these two objects. The cool thing with this is that we are now relying on these interfaces to uh, define our functions. And then our calculator can provide a multiply and an add function back to the user. So maybe these uh, two implementations are maybe um, internal things. Uh, so you're not going to publish these outside of your package. Uh, they're just like implementation details inside of your library that you don't necessarily want other people to have access to, but you want to, to separate out. The cool thing here is that now we can just call these. So we can do adder.add with a and b. Uh, and our, that's, <laughs> that's the wrong thing. Uh, let's pick our multiplier uh, dot mult. And, oh, there we go. <laughs> and, and run it this way. Uh, let's capitalize that and remove our inheritance. Cool. Um, all of that's done, uh, and then we'll just return this. Uh, and then the other thing it's expecting is the adder. This is kind of turning into a slightly longer example. Um, uh, is double your favorite link thing is double from in to create permutations. I'm not sure I know what that means. <laughs> um, uh, I use link a lot, mostly for like list iteration. Um, and I have in the past used it for like the entity framework to do database queries. Um, but mostly I just use it for handling like streaming data. Um, or if I need an infinite list for, for some reason, um, or a list that is going to be kind of uh, building itself over time. Uh, there's lots of fun things you can do with link. Um, cause it, but it is a very different way of thinking than, uh, being explicit like this. Um, so it, it just, it, uh, I, I, I've run into issues in the past uh, on previous teams where I've used something similar to Link um, and then had people come back and say, I don't, 
this is <laughs> this isn't working um and i don't i don't understand uh just just because the concepts are different and you have to kind of slightly change how you're thinking yeah i i agree uh that this uh api is not <laughs> ideal um i'm trying so quickly trying to kind of throw together a quick example uh, of of composition um and may have may may have chosen an example that maybe isn't quite as uh, conducive to that as, as i had hoped um but this will work um <laughs> So what this does, the reason this is useful, the reason why composition becomes a useful concept in testing is that we now have an adder and a multiplier that have implementations and definitions that are separated. What this means is that if I need to change what this adder does, if I need something that is completely different, um, so instead of adding two things, I want to... Um, uh, we're just going to do a count adder. In this case, we were talking about having a test where we wanted to make sure that we were invoking our adder the number of times we wanted to multiply. So in this case, we're just going to implement I adder again. Uh, and then because we have composition, I can just swap in this implementation into our code. Uh, so I don't need to create an entirely new class. I don't need to create a new calculator. I can just say this calculator doesn't actually use that adder. Instead, it's using something else. It's using this one. So um, it looks like it. I was actually writing that for us. Uh, private int count. Sure. <laughs> That'll work. Um, and then this also takes an add. Um, so in this case, we're going to use this for a test. We're not going to uh, run through this, and we're not going to uh, actually return the add results. Instead, what we're going to do is uh, take our count and just count the number of times we invoke it. So every time we run this add, we're just going to do count. Uh, now, there are frameworks that will do this for you that will add mocks and spakes and spies. Um, those are terms that you'll probably want to become familiar with as you are learning more about testing. Um, we just don't have time to cover it all because it's a lot. Um, but uh, what this is doing now is counting the number of times add is invoked. Um, so however many times it's, it's run, we now have this as a re reference. Uh, and then it doesn't return anything. Let's just return 0. Uh, we're not going to use the return value. That is not what we care about. Uh, but here, now we have this uh, test one. We want to test our calculator. So we're going to create a new calculator. And instead of this uh, calculator having an adder, we're going to say the calc dot uh, adder equals a new count adder. So we're, we're initializing this to something else. Um, I need to make this settable. Um, so let's change my code again, uh, because <laughs> um, that's not going to work. Um, let's do something. I mean, we can just do this, right? We can we can just. Uh, this isn't ideal either, uh, but we're going to do that because that'll be quick. Uh, and I'm slightly running out of time, so we're, we're going to we're going to go quick and not necessarily great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, sorry about that. I, I, that's probably not a good example. Don't do that. Um, not not super helpful. But anyway, um, we have our new adder. We're going to count this. Um, so what this is going to do is replace that adder reference. So instead of invoking add, what we're doing is counting the number of times add is invoked. Um, so we run uh, calc add and say run this. Uh, we can give it any number we want. So we can say 42 um, and 3.14. We, we did int, so we can't really do that. Um, but we, we get that. We're expecting this to equal one uh, because we're only invoking add once. Uh, so if I run this test now, we should, well, that's not going to work because we're going to get a zero result. Um, but we can, from this result now, we can actually pull that back out. Um, so if we have our add counter, that's wrong. Counter 
And then we can swap that in. Adder equals our counter. Cool. Uh, and then we can do uh, our counter. And we can pull out this count that we created. Uh, so we're just going to create a quick count. Cool. And then up here, counter.count should be equal to one. And so this is going to allow us to kind of uh, grab these. This is sort of uh, the useful part uh, of composition. Uh, this might not be exactly the best example here. Uh, and unfortunately, maybe a calculator um, it, with this implementation and this time frame, maybe it wasn't the best choice. Uh, but what this is allowing us to do is kind of swap these things in and out. Um, so this allows your architecture to be a little bit more fluid when you're doing this, and it allows your tests to be a little bit um, nicer um, and a little bit easier to kind of kind of change and, and uh, alter the behavior of. Um, it also means your code can kind of work a little bit better with uh, inversion of control operations and things like that, where you might be injecting the behavior into different classes, which is sort of what this multiplier thing is doing. Um, just uh, weirdly. <laughs> um, uh, so if we wanted to test this again, we could do our multiply. Um, so we have multiply. We're expecting this now to be called b time. So this should be um, this should be invoked 314 times um, because we just iterate each time. So there we go. <laughs> um, our test passes. Uh, we don't actually know it fails, so I'm just going to change that to 313. Um, so this should fail. Uh, I just like to make sure that my test isn't something that is always green. Uh, that isn't actually a useful thing for it to do. Um, so we're expecting 313. We got 314, uh, and that will that will work for us. Um, if you can recreate the failure state that you're kind of trying to catch, and it will help you out. Uh, and yeah, I think that's mostly it. The other, th the only other thing that I think we want to get to here. Let me see if I can find this quick. Is the testing pyramid, which is in here. We go. There's an entire section on it. Um, so you might see this. Um, it, it, if you're learning about testing, you're probably going to see some some pyramid. Um, and the, the intention of this is the less wide something is, the less of those tests you should have. Um, and typically how this works is that the y axis, the vertical part of this is going to be the scope of what you're doing. Um, so unit test is very tightly scoped. It's looking at a very small amount of code. Whereas a UI test is going to be actually integrating with a fully rendered UI, clicking on buttons, um, signing into accounts, doing different things. Those become much more fragile uh, and create a lot more uh, toil and time waste uh, if to maintain. So having less of those becomes more useful. Um, so you do, you, these, there's lots of different ways to test things. This is a subset of them. You don't need to necessarily know all of these. But the general guidance is the smaller scope your test is, the more of them you should have. And as the scope of what you're testing increases, you want less of those. Um, that's sort of how, how you should be kind of thinking about testing stuff. Um, but yeah, ho hopefully this is helpful. Um, I kind of wanted to just quickly cover uh, an introduction to tests for people who might not be familiar with it, uh, or if you're a student and trying to figure out how do I how do I make sure my assignment is going to pass? Um, or how does how do I make sure this new modernization effort is going to work? Um, whatever, whatever you're coming from, uh, hopefully this is helpful. Uh, if there are ways or things that you would like to see us dive deeper into, um, this was sort of surface level introductory stuff, um, but we could dive much deeper. Uh, there's there's lots of places for us to go. Uh, so let me know either in a comment here or uh, just call me out later on Twitter or something, and then uh, we'll take a look. Um, but thanks, everybody, and uh, appreciate you all. Before you go, I just have one thing to hop on and say. Um, we do uh, appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, the link has been shared in the chat, and the event code is 15384. Uh, so please let us know, and then uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone.